Shame doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter if you're fat or thin, rich or poor, tall or short. Shame is an equal opportunity emotion and it's amazingly destructive. Research has linked it to violence, addiction, depression, sleep problems, eating disorders, bullying, and anxiety. But what's the difference between guilt and shame? And then what the heck is toxic shame? Well, today I'm answering all your questions and coming at you with my top tips for recovering from toxic shame. So stay tuned. Welcome back to the podcast. I am your ever loving host, Dr. Abby Metcalf, and it's wonderful to have you here. Oh, even though today is a pretty heavy topic, and I did an episode of Shame way back, I think it's season one or two. I, it's like episode like eighty or something. Um, so it was about two hundred episodes ago, and it seemed like something we should revisit. And again, a lot of you have written in. I always appreciate when you let me know what you'd like to hear about. It helps me know that I'm on target with helping you because that's why we're here. We are here to help you move forward in your life in every way. And I will tell you that uh, shame is one of those things that I, you know, being a recovering drug addict had have a lot of um, familiarity with for sure. And, but there were things about shame that I didn't realize uh, that I was feeling was shame. I thought it was embarrassment or something else. And yes, those are all pieces of each other, but shame is a, a bit different. So it's why I titled the, this episode the way it is, because a lot of times it's like tr unhealed trauma. People don't even realize they've had it. And shame I have found is one of those things. Sometimes when I'm talking to an individual or working in a couple or something, I will realize, I'll say something like, wow, you, you know, this is a lot of shame you're holding. And the person will say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I get that a lot. So here we go. Let's, so let's jump in to, um, I, I, I think we have to start with what exactly is shame? You know, what, what are we talking about anyway? Well, so the word shame is derived from a bunch of European words that literally mean to cover, to veil, or to hide. And that precise meaning, it really matches right up with the ways we act when we're ashamed. We, we hide, we veil, we avoid eye contact, we isolate, we, uh, we, fe we feel exposed, we fight, we blame. There's self-consciousness there. I'll talk about that in a minute. We have really an overwhelming sense somehow, even again, if you don't realize it consciously, it's, it's a sense, it's a, something that's underneath. We have this real deep feeling of self-doubt, inadequacy, and it makes us want to hide or retreat. Now, Dr. Judith Jordan, she's, from what I, I mean, I, you know me, I do a lot of research. She's one of the very first to write about this topic. And it was in the late eighties. I know everyone thinks Brene Brown, you know, discovered shame. She, she of course did not. And uh, she, Dr. Jordan defined shame as a felt sense of unworthiness to be in connection. It's a deep sense of unlovability with the ongoing awareness of how very much you want to connect with, with other people. I know it's when you really hear it that way, that's, that's the essence of it. It's, it's knowing that we don't even, that we don't feel lovable enough or, or really can connect, even though it's what we want more than anything. And really shame is more or less a universal emotion. I found research from all, you know, I'm always looking at other countries, um, little shout out there to all the folks who are listening from other, you know, many countries around the world. I'm always amazed that my little tiny podcast that could is reaching so many people um, in so many countries. It fills my heart in ways I it's hard to describe. Uh, so it really is sort of a universal emotion that that spans culture, you know, across cultures. And because I think, you know, it's a it's emotion that's evolved. If you look at, you know, I also looked at work by biological anthropologists, of course, my favorite people, what I wish I'd become and some other uh, incarnation of my soul. Uh, and, you know, this emotion is there to keep us in line. It serves a larger purpose to keep people following rules and norms so society can function as smoothly as possible. Now, I'm not saying that's okay. Obviously, it was a norm for many years to be only heterosexual. 
And so there was so much shame and still is around being gay or lesbian or trans. I won't even get into all the, uh, all the ways we can be in this world because we all know them. And there's obviously shame around that because people, you know, it depends on who is saying what the norm, quote unquote, should be. So uh, obviously we get into a lot of trouble here, but it is there in a way to keep, right? And it obviously was religion for many years and other things to keep us in line. It helps us avoid rejection. Shame helps us avoid being rejected because we want to feel included. We are social animals. We want to feel included and accepted in our families and our towns and our cultures. You know, this is this idea of belonging is huge for for humans, for humanoids. So, and really for many animal species. So, you're gonna feel shame generally unless you have a severe mental health disorder, like um, being antisocial or something. Uh, so you're going to feel shame or what we also call feeling like a piece of shit uh, if you're aware that you've violated some standard or norm in your particular community. That's what happens. So uh, Chris Germer, he's really a, a an eminent psychologist, I would say, in the field of mindfulness and shame and and uh, self-compassion and all that. Uh, he works a lot with Kristen Neff, you know, who's kind of the queen of self-compassion. Uh, he says that love and shame, and I like how he says this, he says, he explains it as two sides of the same coin. Anyone, anyone who feels shame has a desire to feel loved and accepted, you know, that, right. That it, it kind of goes together. Um, and he's written a lot, even with Sheryl Salzberg on self-compassion and, uh, anyway, uh, so but when you think of it that way, again, if you're if you're a sociopath or have antisocial personality disorder in some way, you don't really care about being loved. And so that's why you don't feel shame on the other side also, right? They go together. And of course, the reigning queen on the subject of shame and vulnerability, Brene Brown, who I just mentioned, she, and you know, you got to remember, she's a researcher uh, at the University of Houston. You know, her work is based on research, which I love. I know she's become so popular and... Um, you know, all her books and stuff, but her soul is in research. Uh, she says that shame is an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we're flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. I'm pretty sure that one's from her Rising Strong book, but I'll, I'll you know me, I link to all this in the show notes, abbymedcalf.com, come on over. You can look at all the research and all the links and all the good things. Also a reminder, if you come to the website, if you are listening to the podcast and there's things you want to remember or you know some quote or something, you're thinking, oh my God, I got to write that down. I have a corresponding blog for 99% of all these episodes. So you could just go over to the website and copy and paste from the, or if you just want a refresher on an episode, but don't feel like listening to my fabulous voice for an hour, you know, and you want to read for 10 minutes instead, guess what? You can go over there. Uh, I make it really easy for you because I love you. That's why I write all this up. I love you. And I really am trying to just make sure that everyone can have access to the information and bring it in. So also I have folks from other countries who, um, you know, English isn't your first language. And so what you can do, of course, is take that whole thing from the blog and put it into a translator and you can have the entire, you know, everything I'm saying in a, uh, in your a native language. So anyway, all there for you. So I want to talk now about the difference between guilt and shame, because that's its own thing. And then we'll talk about what's the difference between shame and toxic shame. So the difference between guilt and shame, you know, classically, and it's true, what you classically hear is that guilt is saying I did something bad and shame is saying I am bad. So being, you know, bad means you see yourself, I'm always doing air quotes. So if you're not watching me on YouTube, you don't get to see the air quotes around being bad. Um, and if you are watching me on YouTube, you better, you better like the video, please. And subscribe. You should subscribe to the channel. Um, we're also creating shorter videos of all these so you can get little sound bites or give sound bites to people you love. Um, if they won't listen to the whole episode, um, you know, you can hear little pieces of it. And always on YouTube too, if you like to, you know, 
jump to the good part, so to speak. If you just want the tips and you don't care about the why or the how or any, you know, or the background or anything else or the research, you can jump to that um, pretty easily. So there you go. All right. So being bad, air quotes, means you see yourself really as incapable of changing or doing better. Okay. That that's what's so bad about that. <laughs> however, so the however the that remorse and regret that you likely feel with guilt can it can motivate you to apologize to stop doing a negative behavior or start making positive changes. Brene Brown calls guilt healthy shame. And when we feel guilt, it again can actually move us to do something reparative, you know, apologize, something healthy, create a new behavior. But when we're feeling shame, often we're just paralyzed, right? We're just paralyzed. And it really keeps us locked in those unhealthy behaviors. So let's talk about the difference between shame and toxic shame. So as I already said about, you know, as I already mentioned previously, shame helps us stay in our lane. So you could think of that as maybe the healthy shame. So I know Brene Brown calls guilt the healthy shame, but I, I think even within the shame category, right, there's toxic and there's like a healthier on point feeling. And that, again, kind of more healthy shame or guilt keeps people ethical and following along, right, with whatever the expected behaviors are. So when you feel that more healthy shame or guilt, you want to get better, you want to grow, you want to make changes, you want to apologize. That's the difference. But toxic shame, totally different animal. It is a very harmful state of mind that undermines mental health, undermines it. Toxic shame, oh, it, it's like it uproots our very foundation, if, if you even ever had a foundation. And it really becomes a pervasive habit of thought. And what I think is so key about toxic shame is that it leaves you feeling helpless and hopeless. With guilt or quote unquote healthy shame, we have moments where we just feel like, oh my God, I'm such a piece of crap. And oh my God, I can't believe I did that. I'm never going to be able to walk into that room again. I'm never going to be able to talk to that person again. I'm, you know, we get into a minute of catastrophizing and feeling helpless and hopeless, but then we shift and we get motivated and we, and we do something else. So that's the difference. The toxic shame really is that helpless, hopeless feeling that's permanent. Because again, if I'm a piece of shit, I can't do anything. So you do, so you think things like that, you know, I'm, I'm a horrible human who doesn't deserve love versus, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, face palming, right? I can't believe I did that. And now how do I make amends? How do I fix that? See the difference, the action? I'm broken. I'm just broken, Abby. I'm broken versus, you know, I've never learned skills of how to be healthy in a relationship. I need, I really need to work on that, man. I, I cannot give up on myself. I'm a failure. Nothing I, everything I touch turns to crap versus, um, you know, everyone messes up and I just haven't figured this out yet. You know, I love the word yet, right? Just haven't gotten there yet. Our, our, our deep need to be loved and accepted, this, this again, uh, DNA imperative can drive really this all-encompassing fear of being abandoned or rejected. So when, when someone experiences toxic shame, the last thing they want to do is tell anyone about it. They don't want to share it. So because they don't want to be rejected. I don't want to share this thing and show how vulnerable or horrible I am. Uh, people will reject me even, right? So we keep the secrets or, and hide or try to stay below the radar with our true feelings, our true wants, our thoughts. And this creates more disconnection with those people around us. And it deepens our shame. It's a toxic, unending cycle of pain and loneliness. Do you see how this plays on itself? Do you see how this, you know, rolls around? So. Again, healthy shame, guilt, it's a temporary thing. Maybe you lied to a friend and you're feeling guilty about it and some shame about it. But after you apologize, the shame and guilt lessen. The longer you act within sort of a normal range of telling the truth, you know, or whatever that is for you, the more distant the shame becomes until it's either gone entirely, you can't even remember, or 
or maybe it's an occasional twinge when you remember the situation. Uh, something I've shared on here before is, of course, when I was a drug addict, I did many, many things that were uh, very out of my character and who I believe I am, even who I believed I was at the time. And uh, I, for so many of us, reconciling that later is so difficult. And I, um, I'll share this, you know, I was in a, I remember I was in a lot of drug rehabs, but I purposefully checked myself into a drug rehab once to sell drugs, to make money. Cause I knew I could make more money in the rehab. And so can you imagine these poor people were going to drug rehab to get clean, like had honest feelings of wanting to change their lives. And I did this, I mean, heinous, heinous act of purposefully, not just, it's bad enough to have someone relapse who's trying to stay clean and sober, but then charge them, you know, even more money. Cause I knew I could like, it's so, it's such a heinous act. And it's so, oh, even talking about it now, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm talking about it. It's, it's, it was so long ago, but I still, I can feel the twinge of shame around it. I have made amends. I've worked through the steps. I have talked about this issue. I have talked in therapy about it this and other things I did, um, that just, I can't even, I'm like, how, like, how did I do that? Um, I get it. It's a brain disease. Addiction is, you know, I get, that's how you get out of it. You start to know it's a brain disease. It's not a personality trait I ever had. It's a symptom of my disease and how entrenched I was in the disease. It doesn't make it okay. It doesn't mean it was, oh, I don't have to think about it. It means that it, I don't have to feel shame the rest of my life about it. And so for me, when I talk about it, like right now, I'm really being aware of where I feel this. I feel it very much in my chest. I feel it in my throat. Like I don't want to say it. I don't want to share it. Um, but I do. And But I don't feel I used to, my stomach used to drop out. I, I would actually shake when I spoke about it. Definitely crying. I, I, I could cry. <laughs> you know me, I could cry anyway. Um, but uh, it, it's... I feel a little embarrassed sharing it. Like I can, I can be in touch with all that, but there's nothing that's overwhelming me. And it's not something I think about all the time anymore, where it used to be. It was something I came back to over and over as I self-sabotaged, as I told myself what a horrible human I was. Um, it was something that I could repeat on, put on repeat to help me stay stuck. Okay, I'm going to sip of water. Um, <clears throat> so... Do you see the difference though? So it starts to, it, it doesn't have such a hold over time. But with toxic shame, that feeling is there all or most of the time. It's somewhere. And I, and again, I experienced toxic shame about this, this particular thing and many other things for years. And even when, you know, people are in sobriety, you know, even when you're in new sobriety, you, you haven't necessarily changed your whole life. I still lied. I still, you know, there was a time when I still wasn't, it wasn't long, thank God, but you know, that first year of being clean and sober, you know, it, it's, it's, it's this shit show people like it's hard. And I was, it wasn't suddenly like, you know, when you give up drugs and alcohol, like you suddenly becomes perfect. That's not how that works. Um, and so, you know, really working on myself over the many years and trying different programs and different things and different kinds of therapy, you know, is how I sort of worked through a lot of that trauma and my earlier trauma and all those things. But, you know, that toxic shame, it, oh, you know, that that's a toughie. And that feeling, if it's there most of the time, you decide you are, I'm a liar or I am unworthy. Or it may, you know, and let me say this, you might have never done anything, you, anything, but you were raised to believe you're not worthy of love. So you think this is a personality trait or defines you in some way. It's who you are. And, and it, although you have no control over how you were parented as a kid or what a coach yelled at you when you were a teen. You, you've integrated those words of others into your self-concept and they feel permanent. You might even think, because you might have been told by a parent that you were responsible for their reactions to you. Uh, so you really think, oh no, Abby, I, I did. I did some bad things when I was a kid. And maybe you eventually did do some things as a kid that it is still not okay for 
for that kind of parenting. It, it's not. And again, one begets the other in many ways. So, and we know, of course, that children of any kind of abuse feel shame, even though they are they are the last ones at fault for what's happened to them. Or maybe you grew up really poor or with an alcoholic parent and felt shame about either of those things. Um, never had kids over to your house to play you and because of those things and kept a lot of secrets about your home life for whatever or for some other reason. All of these circumstances can easily become internalized toxic shame. So let's talk about signs of toxic shame. And there's been a lot of research showing that toxic shame can manifest psychologically, of course, but also physically. You know, there's a lot of, we secrete a lot of stress hormones because toxic shame and your shame is so stressful and that triggers a lot of physical symptoms. So we can see wanting to sleep all the time or an inability to sleep, stomach pain or GI issues, headaches, overeating or loss of appetite. And of course, the psychological issues that can result from toxic shame are, are many, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem and feelings of self-worth, which can also, of course, be um, su some suicidality, uh, substance use disorders, including eating disorders, anger and rage outbursts, codependency or fawning, self-consciousness, which I'll talk about, ongoing feelings of inadequacy, a negatively impacted sense of self. I know, it's quite a bit. And let me say this, if you've ever been self-conscious, you have felt shame. And this blew me away. I think it was our, our lovely Brene Brown where I first read this. When I first read this, I thought, oh my, what? I did not realize that. I, I cause I've certainly been self-conscious. Shame and humiliation, along with guilt and embarrassment, belong to a family of emotions that are referred to as the self-conscious emotions. And they're, so, they're called the self-conscious emotions because they make you think about yourself. You become, you guessed it, self-conscious. So I know. So now other emotions you might not have realized are also shame-based are feelings of insecurity, of course, feeling dumb or stupid, or feeling like you've never reached the bar, you know, that feeling. So shame can really result in underachieving, in self-sabotage, and perfectionism. I I know, I know, I know. Sit with it, sit with it, take it in. Ugh. Thomas Shelf, uh, Thomas, sorry, Shelf, Chef. It's like S-C-H-E-F-F, -F. Thomas Chef. He's a professor emeritus at UC Santa Barbara. He says that shame is the most obstructed and hidden emotion and therefore destructive. And here's what he says. He says, emotions are like breathing. They cause trouble only when obstructed. How do you like that? Ooh. Mic drop, mic drop. I'm not going to drop my mic. It's very expensive. Okay. And I didn't say it, so he did. All right, so what causes shame? I, I kind of covered this, but I want to go there quickly before we get to our tips. You know, most most often than not, shame stems from some kind of childhood experiences. The the issue is that you might not think you have shame because you had a quote unquote good childhood. And shame, of course, can arise from major trauma, sexual, emotional, or physical abuse, neglect. But shame, as I mentioned earlier, also comes from the more quote unquote, like innocent ways our parents or people important to us interacted with us. Maybe you were a little kid, you know, you spilled the glass of juice, you know, kids do that. But instead of your parents saying, oh, don't worry, you know, these things happen or, you know, maybe you had a parent or even a sibling who would yell at you, you're such a klutz, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you, you're always doing stuff like this, right? Starts to become internalized. Shame also comes about because of again, other kinds of judgment or criticism, you know, give me that you're always doing it wrong anyway. Uh, maybe someone dismissed or demean your efforts or your wins. Maybe I see a lot of comparisons to older siblings, you know, uh, oh, you should just quit baseball and try something else. You'll never be as good as your brother or being compared to a kid down the street, you know, you know, why can't you be more like Juan? Like, why can't you be more like him? So Sometimes shame doesn't come also from your home environment. It could have been, again, a coach who humiliated you in front of your team 
or a teacher who embarrassed you by pointing out, you know, mistakes in class or something, or the fact that you couldn't read or couldn't read quickly. And based on this perspective, you know, heightened shame arises from not having our early needs sufficiently satisfied. I mean, I think that's what we can say. So, and again, physical or emotional abuse or neglect, any interactions that encourage a kid to believe I'm bad rather than I did something bad, they all contribute to shame. Okay. So, uh, you know, how are shame affecting your relationships and all this is huge, 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 huge. And uh, there's a wonderful book called The Healing Connection by Jean Baker Miller and Irene Stiver. And they and they say this with shame and in relation to relationships, which is oh, so good. Another mic, another mic drop moment. Get ready. They said, we become so fearful of engaging others because of our past neglects or our humiliations and violations that we begin to keep important parts of our experience out of connection with these other people. We don't feel safe enough to more fully represent ourselves in our relationships, in our relational encounters. So experiences of shame or humiliation, you know, uh, being scorned, ridiculed, belittled, ostracized, demeaned, all of those can disrupt our ability to initiate and participate in the relationships that could otherwise help us grow. The the Healing Connection is a really great book. So in the end, you know, these shaming experiences, they taught us that to be safe, we need to disconnect and we need to separate ourselves from others, especially the people closest to us. And there's other research out of the, the Stone Center at Wellesley College, and this is by Linda Hartling and Jean Baker Miller, same woman. They found, okay, they found three main responses to shame, which they termed are strategies for disconnection. One is that you move away from it, you isolate, you don't talk about it, you keep secrets. Two is that you move towards it, you become really people-pleasing, you're fawning, you're codependent. Or the third way we deal with it is that we move, you move against it. You fight back. You try to hurt the other person, you know, maybe as badly as you've been hurt. So we do generally one of those three things. And Brene Brown calls those, those three responses your shame shields. So no matter which one you do, and you might do all three, you're moving away from your true self, your connection with your partner, with the people you love. All right. So what do you do? I'm there. So what do you do when you're feeling toxic shame? What do you do? Brene Brown says there are three basic steps to handling emotional setbacks like shame. Okay. So, and I'm not going to spend too much time here because I'm going to get into some other tips, but she says the three steps are, you know, reckoning, This is where mindfulness and self-awareness come in. This is a step where you realize you're having an emotional reaction to something. So the idea is to become curious so you can explore it more fully. And you know, I got a ton on mindfulness and how to be more mindful. Download the mindfulness starter kit, get to it if you haven't yet. I, you know, really make, I have put mindfulness in the search bar of my website. I, all the stuff will come up on how to do it, all the nitty gritty about mindfulness. Okay. Get, get on it. If you look, if you're on YouTube, I have mindfulness hacks. I have videos on mindfulness, how to be mindful in a few minutes. I, and if you're not on YouTube, go on YouTube and, and put that in Abby Metcalf mindful and all the hacks will come up. And these are short videos, uh, little ways to get mindful. So check them out. Uh, the second step is rumbling that Brene Brown talks about rumbling now that you, so now that you recognize you have this reaction, right? This emotional reaction, you got to pay attention to the narrative or the story you're telling yourself about what happened. What's true and what's not about you know, like you have to decide, is this true or is it not? What's the dialogue you're having with yourself in your head? 
because they're probably two different things. The truth and the dialogue are two different things. So it's really reality checking. You know, who says? What else could be true about this? The goal is to have a new understanding of your thoughts so you can act, not react in situations. And I highly recommend the what's called the ABC format for this, which was created by Albert Ellis. I will link in the show notes to an entire, um, you know what I'm going to do? You know, I'm writing it down right now. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Um, I'm going to, if you come to the website, uh, I'm going to, I have an RET, it's called Rational Mode of Therapy, the way you do this, the way you think different about a situation. I'm going to link in the show notes to an exercise. I have it all written out for you. Okay. How you do it. A, B, C, D. You don't have, you can just down, you can just download the exercise itself. I'm realizing that's the most love I could give you right now. I, this is something I give to my private clients. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, I, you can come over and download that. Okay. And it'll take you through this. And I'm going to talk about other, I'm going to talk about this more in the tips later. So, uh, it, I'm realizing i I should have just thought of that right away. But anyway, so there you go. I'm going to really, even after this, I'm going to give you all the tips and then you can come download. It's free when you download uh, more nitty gritty. All right. And then the third thing that she, third step she talks about, Brene Brown talks about is revolution. Now that you're noticing your reaction and the faulting, faulty thinking associated with it, it's time to change how you're interacting with other people, right? Again, this is from her Rising Strong book. I'm 99% 99% sure. I, I'll link, I'll make sure I link in the show notes. But again, when you're here with me, you want more nitty gritty tools. So here are other tips to keep in mind. Again, that change, or, or I should say other ways to extrapolate on what these three things she just talked about. So again, number one, changing the narrative. You Again, you've got to create an inner dialogue that has self-compassion, self-acceptance, forgiveness, and you really do that with something called cognitive reframing. And at its most basic level, cognitive reframing helps you it helps you look at a situation or a person or a thought or a feeling from a different angle, a different perspective. It, it's really a strategy that helps you open your mindset to a new point of view. Again, like a new angle on what's happening so you can think differently about it and learn how to you know, let it go, learn how to move on, how to get quote unquote, you know, get over it. And it's crucial because what do I say all the time? You feel the way you think. So changing your thinking about something will change your feeling about it. That's how you go from feeling crappy to feeling at peace about something. You can't, you can't stop letting it bother you and stop thinking about it. Right. You you, you know, just by saying that, right. But you can stop overthinking. You can stop thinking about it by by really doing these tips. And I did a previous episode called uh, How to Stop Overthinking and Let Things Go That Bother You that I will also link to in the show notes. And you can also look by that exact title on my website or on wherever you're downloading the the episode, uh, wherever you're downloading your your podcast. and uh, again, I'll link to that though in the show notes. And you that really, the cognitive reframing really takes you through. And along with this rational emotive therapy exercise, the RET exercise I said you could download, they're the same thing in different ways. They really are. It's the same thing. It's how you feel the way you think. You got to change your thoughts to change your feelings. So I would, if you really want to go deep on changing your shame, I would listen to that other episode and download the this exercise and really do the work. Practice it. Practice, practice. You're it's amazing. Um, I would say the other thing tip I really want is that you got the secrets have to go. Shame needs to be taken out of the shadows and shared with at least one trusted person in your life. And this a trusted person, this is that person who loves you no matter what and is there with no judgment. Okay. So if you don't have a person like that in your life, and even if you do, I highly recommend connecting with a reputable therapist if you're dealing with toxic shame. If you if this is stuff you can't stop overthinking, you're ruminating about, it's really getting in your way, please, please get professional help if you can. This podcast is here because I know a lot of people do not have access to professional help, either don't have reputable people there, or maybe culturally it's very shameful to go for therapy. Um, maybe you don't have the money for it. You know, you just can't afford it. 
that's why all of this is free. It is meant to, you know, but I will tell you that on some level, therapy is obviously, you know, what I believe in, right? Is is what I think is the highest level. But you can get better on your own. It's it's just a little harder. So if you can find someone, you know that person that always says yes first and then asks questions later, or you can, you know, have the conversation and start with, listen, I have to tell you something that's really hard for me. I've been carrying a lot of shame about something. I do not want any reaction except love and no suggestions, no advice, no nothing, just that I'm okay that you love me, even though you're hearing this. Is that something you think you can do? You know, ask. Set the set the conversation up for success. Don't self-sabotage. Don't set it up to 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 not work. And so I do this, you know, I do this with my beloved Gary a lot. I'll say to him, you know, we talk a lot about do you want comfort or solutions is a nice way to uh to start a conversation, you know. So I I'll let him know right up. Like I don't want suggestions or advice. I I really want, I need a lot of comfort about this. And it's something really hard to talk about. So I need you to really take a breath before you say anything to me because this is really tough. When we set up a conversation like that, we have a really great chance of having a wonderful outcome. So, but talking about it, taking out of the shadows, being vulnerable in a safe environment will release, help release toxic shame. I will also tell you another tip, learn more, get your education on about shame. Make sure this isn't the last thing you listen to or read or, you know, watch about how to overcome shame. You've really got to uh, spend some time on this. Again, I've mentioned this before, you know, if you use the RET tool, the little tool you're going to download, if you use that, you know, once it's going to be great. Okay, good. Or maybe not great. Maybe nothing will happen, but you know, you got to stick to it, right? Anything you, you want to get better at takes hours of practice, takes repetition, right? Takes the frequency. So please don't give up. Don't do something, you know, don't, try this and go, oh, I'm not better yet of my shame that I've been carrying for 30 years. I've been trying this for a whole month. Are you kidding me? Like it's going to take some time. That's why pe- some people stay in therapy a long time. It, it's going to take a minute, but do the work and you will notice changes. That's sort of how it works. You got to believe in yourself. I believe in you. I have faith in you. I know that if you're listening to me, you want to change your life and you're smart. That's what I know. I know it. Because people who aren't smart hate my podcast. <laughs> they don't want to know the research. They don't want to know the background. They don't want, they complain about, oh, shut up and get to the point already. That's what they're doing. They, you want to know, you want to understand really what this is. So even now, as you're listening, if you're feeling, maybe you're feeling a little shame now because you skipped, maybe you're watching on YouTube and you skipped to the part where you could see where the, the tips are, right? Because it's divided. Um, Go back and listen to the whole thing. If you really want to get over toxic shame, really listen, really read the whole book kind of thing. Don't just jump to the chapter about how you get better. This is a pretty short overall, right, way to absorb this information. But, you know, this isn't soundbite stuff. This isn't 30-second things. This isn't even 15-minute things that's going to make the big change. You have to really put, think about that. If you played tennis for 10 minutes a day, would you expect to be Serena Williams in a month? I don't think so. But if you spent hours a day practicing and really giving a lot of attention and focus to it, watching your food and doing other exercises, yeah, you wouldn't play like Serena by the end of the month, but you'd certainly be really good, a lot better than 10 minutes here and there by the end of the month. You know, it's what you put in. So I, I do, got, I have to say that in these days of people wanting immediate gratification all the time for everything and little sound bites and reels and, you know, shorts and all that, it's, I get it. I like them too. But when you're really trying to shift something that's been there a while, you're going to need to spend some time. Number four, my last, I think, tip is you got to know your triggers. So, you know, again, I mentioned this earlier, if there's something you feel insecure about, it probably has its origins in shame. So maybe you had a crappy mom and now you're worried that you're not a good mom. So when your partner, you know, makes an observation about your parenting, you get defensive and angry. So there are many triggers. 
but Dr. You know, again, Dr. Brown, Brene Brown says that the primary shame trigger for women still remains physical appearance, appearance, while for men, it's the fear of being seen as weak. Isn't that interesting? Those are those primary triggers. I did do a previous episode on how to deal with triggers. I think I'm going to do a new a new one at some point. Um, I think I'll probably update that, but I do have an older that I'll link to on triggers. Um, but now, now I'm sitting here going, oh, I should do, I should do an update on how to deal with triggers. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do an update on how to deal with triggers. <laughs> but if you want to read the old one, it's there, or listen to the old one, it's there. Uh, so that is everything. If you are um, here with me and you made it to the end, oh, I love you. Thank you for your beautiful reviews on of the podcast. If you haven't left a review yet or rated it on Spotify, please, please, please do. It helps other people find me. It helps us spread the word. It helps with I want world domination because I want, I believe, you know I do, if everyone in the world had access to this information and could really feel happy in their lives and relationships, we war, hate, all this horrible crime, all the things going on, the greed that's overtaken so much here in the United States would be a thing of the past. So please, you know, pass the word, share this with someone you think it would help. And remember our, again, where you and I are in a relationship, I am teaching you about relationships. And if you just sit back and think, oh, I just get and get and get, that's how it works. That's what Abby just gives me. Uh, that entitlement is not where we're at. You and I are in a reciprocal relationship. So I love when you write into me and tell me how something has helped you. I love when you Abby at abbymedcalf.com, by the way, or the Let's Connect page on my website, or when you write in and tell me a, a great topic I might want to cover, you can leave a review, you can buy a mug, you can, there's so many ways for us to be in a reciprocal relationship. There's so many ways for you to give. You can support me financially if you want. I, I need to pay my bills like anyone else. Um, I appreciate it. And that's wonderful and beautiful. And anything I have for sale is always something meant to help you. So even that's reciprocal. It's not just like, give a donation. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but if you feel like you have no money and no other means, then I, re then I really think you need to, again, subscribe. Even if you don't watch me on YouTube, go subscribe. What will it hurt? You know, go like a video, go listen, whatever. These are all ways to support and for us to stay in this relationship so that you really understand what relationships are about. They're not just about giving and they're not just about receiving. They are always reciprocal. That's how we feel best. You will feel best in our relationship if you give in some way. If you, again, let me know that if it's helping you. That's giving. You know, whatever that is, I'm telling you, you're going to feel good. And I'm going to respond. I, I, it takes me a while sometimes, but I do respond. I love you. I'm so glad you're here. I believe in you. I have faith in you. Please have faith in yourself. I'll speak to you real soon.